Well, good evening, everybody. This is True Seeker here, and as you can tell by my surroundings, I'm on a business trip, and um, I had a few minutes tonight to be able to get a couple of things that I've been thinking about uh, recorded. Hopefully, I can talk about these in uh, a relatively short amount of time. But it has to do with uh, some of the some of the things that I uh, have been thinking about. My my whole life was surra surrounded by the Bible students. My my grandparents on both sides of my family, even my great-grandparents. I knew my great-grandmother. I knew my uh, maternal great-grandfather and my maternal great-grandmother. Uh, on my grandmother's side, and uh, they were the ones that had been introduced to the Bible students by um, the ship's purser on the um, Columbia. Uh, it was the steamship uh, Columbia. I, I think it was a British line um, sometime around 1906. The purser of the ship was a Bible student, and they were uh, moving to Brooklyn, and he... Um, mentioned, oh, this was 1909, not 1906. My grandmother was six. That's where the six comes in. Uh, and they they were moving to Brooklyn, and the Bethel had, um, or the work that had been done in Allegheny at the Bible House had moved to the Bethel in Brooklyn, uh, they bought, actually, properties that had been um, originally owned by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, that's really a, kind of an interesting legacy. Uh, they, they knew about this property, and they bought it. And then she was a, uh, a very well-known uh, abolitionist. Uh, that wrote, um, I believe it was Little Women. And I'm going to check myself on that. Uh, I'm going to fact check myself because I don't want to be wrong. Harriet Beecher Stowe. And uh, she was... Uh, let's see. Uncle Tom's Cabin, I'm sorry. Uh, that was um, probably the most influential book of the 19th century was Uncle Tom's Cabin. And um, anyway, she had uh, owned a um, property in uh, Brooklyn and that they they um, the Bible students had uh, purchased this. She was very influential in the um, in the abolitionist movement and the the, the cause to free the slaves uh, before the Civil War began. And, you know, the, the, the Civil War played a very critical role in the um, in the um, shaping of religion in the 19th century, especially millennialism um, and uh, a, a special brand of, of uh, independent 
uh, Protestantism that was unique to America. Uh, America at the time was was um, ripe for religious, um, uh, let's say, people gravitating to religion because of the significance of the the profound effect that the Civil War had on. On individuals, if you if you question me on this, check out uh, David Blight, uh, who gave a lecture series. Uh, he was a Yale historian and specialist in the uh, Civil War. Uh, we used to listen to his uh, lecture series, and uh, he talked about um, especially the effect of uh, the war and the the uh, deaths uh, that um, the, the the number of deaths that that both sides uh, that were inflicted upon both sides, north and south, uh, people had a profound effect on the individuals who wanted to contact uh, loved ones and uh, see the loved ones again, and the Bible students. Uh, had a had a, a doctrine that you would see your loved ones again. This was what Russell taught that that God had a plan, and that part of this plan was to allow humanity to experience the the exceedingly the exceeding sinfulness of sin. <laughs> And that the that the uh, human race would then benefit by this experience, and and uh, then would contrast that to the resurrection in the thousand year kingdom, when everybody would get a chance to see their loved ones again. Now, remember when Russell began his interest in the Bible, which was around 1870, 18. 80s, and there were still a lot of individuals alive that that um, lived through the war, that uh, lost loved ones or were were impacted uh, very heavily in some way uh, from the war. A tremendous number of casualties. There, there are estimates uh, that I've heard. Um, that reach as high as a million uh, deaths uh, attributed to the Civil War. Most uh, most uh, st statistics that I've read put it in the six hundred to seven hundred thousand men um, killed. But when you consider that the North had an army of about two million men and the South about half that. Um, that is that is a um, that is uh, uh, about one third, a little less than a third, maybe a quarter of all the all the men that fought in the war uh, were were killed, and and the casualty rate was much higher, um, and that was because weapons were deadlier, and, and people you know we're fighting old fashioned tactics with uh, more deadly weapons newer weapons rapid fire um guns they they had invented the gatling gun they had invented uh repeating rifles and uh, revolvers and uh they had um, rifles that were deadly at 800 yards and these guys were still fighting the Polyanic tactics where armies literally marched up to one another in lines and they were cutting cutting one another down with these with these guns. And um, <clears throat> you know the, the population of the United States as a whole uh, was no more than 30 million uh, people at the time the uh, the greater part of that population was in the north. 
uh, the greater part of the industrialization was in the north. Um, the south was still agrarian, largely. Um, the larger part of the population, there were, there were about 4 million uh, slaves. Uh, there were about 9 million that lived in the south. Uh, so uh, one third of the country's population lived in the south, uh, but uh, the the um, about half of that, um, a little less than half of that, were were um, slaves, and uh, and uh, the slave owners and, and and many of the people that that lived in the south were afraid of. Um, uh, tremendous uprising, and uh, they 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 didn't um, they didn't want to they didn't want to shake things up. They wanted the status quo. Uh, their livelihoods, their whole economy was uh, based on uh, on the slave labor that they were getting. The free labor it was free. Uh, they were not they were not paying. Uh, I mean, they they had to feed, and clothe, and but they were doing the bare minimum of that. Uh, you know, the, the the slaves were living you know, horrific lives, and uh, it's a terrible, terrible period of our history. But um, when you think about what happened in the Civil War and the 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 tragedy and the deaths and the her horrific number of uh, you know everybody knew somebody who was was killed uh, in the Civil War. Um, the, the there was a significant rise. I think uh, Blight uh, indicated that during the four years of the war itself, there were some. There was only a handful of uh, books published on uh, religion and the afterlife, and uh, I think there were. I think he, he claimed eight books. And then in, in the 1870s uh, alone, there were over 80 books published uh, on the afterlife. And some of them were quite bizarre, where they would get very descriptive about what heaven was like and, and, and being able to, to find your, your loved ones in heaven and, and holding out all these hopes. And, and Russell was one of these uh, cranks that, that got involved in this and rode that wave of, um, of religious interest. And it wasn't only just religion. There, there was an increase in occultism. Uh, that's why uh, it carried over. It spilled over into the 20th century. And um, Houdini uh, spent quite a bit of time uh, debunking uh, spiritism and the occult uh, as a fraud. Uh, but these people were making a lot of money uh, trying to put the the you know dead loved one in contact with uh, with uh, people, and this was all as a result. This all grew out of the of the Civil War, and uh, I, I urge you to to hear um, what David Blight had to say. Uh, it's a fascinating lecture series that he he gives, and he also offers up a lot of reading material. I frankly haven't had the opportunity to um, to read many of the things that he uh, recommended, but uh, that was a college course, and I um, I don't have the the time uh, to. Uh, do an intense study of of everything uh, like you, when you're in college you your your whole life is dedicated to uh, the work that your professors uh, put you to uh, task to um, to complete but uh, I just don't have that time uh, but um, it's fascinating to, to, to hear because then you kind of get the idea and the setting of what what transpired and why uh, Russell began to have some success in the uh, late 1870s and the early 1880s um, in attracting uh, individuals to his special brand of, of religion. And I think most cruel um, 
was the prospect of you're going to see your loved ones again. And this is something that, that um, everybody suffers because we, we all have loved ones. You know, if we live any, any length of time, uh, somebody very dear to us is going to pass away. And, and uh, I, I remember my grandfather, um, how lonely he was in his 90s. He was almost 94 when he passed away. Uh, his, his siblings had, had he out, outlived all his siblings. Uh, uh, he had, except for his half-sister, uh, he had outlived most of his friends. Uh, he... Um, most of the most of his acquaintances and the Bible students uh, were, were passed on. Uh, his whole generation um, were, were, were they they passed away, and um, he was he was alone and he was grieving uh, in that loneliness. And my grandmother, having um, she did outlive him, but uh, she had lost her mind to Alzheimer's and, and very badly and and so he had lost her too and this this hope that he had in the kingdom that the kingdom would remedy all of these things that he would see his friends that he would see the, the his loved ones and in particular his mother now his, my my grandfather's mother when he was 12 my grandfather was born in 1899 um, my maternal grandfather was born in 1899, and my um, great grandmother uh, died when he was 12 of tuberculosis. They didn't have a cure for tuberculosis at that time, and he and uh, he was uh, the second youngest of four boys, and and uh, they they. It, it, it really hit them very hard uh, because he was uh, at a very um, sensitive age, uh, being 12 years old and losing your mother uh, was, was devastating to him. And uh, his father, uh, my great-grandfather, uh, married a second time, um, and she was um, a very... Um, kind woman, very nice woman, who was willing to take on four boys uh, to, to raise. And uh, she, never, um, she never had been married before, but she was Catholic, and they, they were Protestant. And believe me, back in those days, uh, there was uh, very little tolerance. There was a very, uh, there was a tremendous amount of animosity between uh, Protestantism and Catholicism in in this country, and so she was not accepted by uh, any of my, uh, you know, grandfather or his uh, siblings. Um, he felt you know, some guilt later on in life about that because he realized, you know, uh, what what a challenge it was that she took on. Uh, but um, his hope was to to see his mother again he he was devastated that he lost his mother and apparently he was very very close to her and um, it, it impacted him so that as an 87 year old man I, I can remember my one of my grandfather's last talks uh, that he gave as an elder in the New York Ecclesia uh, he talked about his favorite doctrine of the of the Bible students is probably the only doctrine he really really put any stock in and 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 really hoped was true was the doctrine of the resurrection so that he could see his mother again and when he had talked about his mother and, and his hope to see her in the resurrection, he broke down and cried. Uh, he was so deeply impacted by her death and so, so taken in by 
this doctrine and this false hope that it gave him to to have this hope that he'd see her again that that he um that he had broken down and cried uh he hadn't coped with her death it, it had a profound impact on him his entire life now he 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 passed away at, at almost 94 just months shy of 94 years old but uh that that was something that was a lifelong thing with him since his mother had died that's what drew him into the truth that's why he bought into the religion because he, he wasn't uh he wasn't a uh, uh he was a smart man i mean he he rose through the ranks uh to a very high position in um, one of the biggest banks in new york during the um, middle 20th century and uh, he worked on under um, William Howard Taft the um, second he was the nephew of the president William Howard Taft and uh, my grandfather knew some very powerful people the blue bloods of New York society like uh, the Roosevelt's uh, he, he knew Archibald Roosevelt the son of uh, Teddy Roosevelt through the banking circles and called him Archie took me through Sagamore when I was 14 uh, to see the home um, and he he they had photographs of the uh, Theodore Roosevelt's family and uh, and he would point out Archie for me and uh, my grandfather was a pallbearer at uh, William Howard Taft II's funeral, and he knew these people. I I, I checked online, and and there are all these uh, bank records uh, of his bank, uh, dating back into the twenties and thirties, and uh, they they um, had a board of directors with uh, uh, very uh, influential names. Um, uh, Kennedy was one of them, um, and there, there was, um, there, there were. He he moved in some uh, very, uh, you know, U.S. aristocratic circles. Old money, nineteenth-century money. These were the. These were the captains of industry uh, during the. Uh, 19th century, and these were the the uh, the subsequent generation who took um, who took their the, the money that they inherited and uh, went into banking. It's uh, it's kind of like Cornelius Vanderbilt, who um, built the empire uh, first with uh, boats. They called him Commodore Vanderbilt, uh, and then with the the rail road uh system new york central and and uh became the wealthiest person of the mid 19th century and when he passed away his son william took all of that inheritance and became a banker and that's what happened with a lot of the children of these um, very wealthy 19th century capitalists and entrepreneurs and uh they they um and for example the rockefellers many of them went into politics and uh and uh other pursuits because they they had the the money to do it and my grandfather it rose from obscurity he didn't we didn't come from many you know family background ties money uh, and he worked his way up into the into those circles. I once found a photograph of my grandfather, and uh, that that I got from my grandfather. He was attending a banking uh, uh, a banking uh, seminar, and 
in uh, Washington, D.C., and the wives uh, of these uh, bankers, uh, top bankers of New York, um, went to the White House, and they were all gathered together, and, and here's President Kennedy uh, addressing the wives of these bankers, and they were standing out there with their overcoats. I could pick out my grandmother in this photograph, but there was Jack Kennedy, and uh, it was toward the end of his um, toward the end of his presidency. Uh, it was not too long before he was um, um, uh, assassinated. Now, the the uh, fascinating thing to me is that I never even knew that they had even done this because, for one thing, they they didn't uh, like the Kennedys uh, because they were Catholic and secondly uh, they, they made their money in alcohol and uh, thirdly they didn't like his politics they were they were more conservative and um, even though the Bible students were supposed to have political leanings um, many of the uh, Bible students that um, they moved in the, the circles of uh, were probably the better off Bible students and uh, had more money, uh, were formed sort of an elite little club or clique and uh, tended to be more on the conservative side. If you had uh, a conservative political element in the Bible students, they would have been it. And uh, my grandfather... Um, made uh, quite a few Bible students um, uh, wealthy, uh, relatively wealthy by the, um, by giving uh, uh, tips uh, as to what to invest in. And that was his specialty in the bank uh, was um, uh, investments and property investments and such. And so um, a lot of Bible students profited in that but that I think was what kept him in the Bible students was this hope of the resurrection and and it's a devastating thing um, you know I, I mean this is something that that's uh, both the the Bible students and the Jehovah's Witnesses have in common is this teaching this doctrine that that um, uh, you'll get to see your loved one if you if you just believe what we have to say and stick around with us. Um, you we'll, we'll guarantee that your all the problems will be solved in the kingdom. You know, defer the problems like, like my brother and his his uh, mental condition and the suicidal tendencies and. Uh, you know, my grandfather, um, he was well into his 90s, uh, but he, he would uh, acknowledge that my brother was in dire straits, uh, but he, he would say uh, he needs the kingdom so badly. My parents, who were in a position to, to be able to do more, uh, being my brother's parents um, could have could have intervened a little more, uh, looked to see what they could have done, but were firmly um, firmly believed that that his only hope was the kingdom, so they didn't even try. We tried. We had our own issues at the time. We were struggling to survive, my wife and I, in a tough environment. And I was in college, and and uh, my brother obviously was going through a very, very difficult period. Uh, as he had a, a marriage that fell apart. He had uh, a tragic death uh, that... that um, he was involved in with his uh, best friend, um, 
it was a lack of judgment. They were, were using alcohol and uh, they took an old boat out in, in a, a lake. The water temperature was just above freezing because the lake had just thawed and they turned the boat over and his friend couldn't swim and he drowned. And my brother survived and, and you know, all these tragic things happening in his life uh, had a irreversible, um, his use of drugs, um, some of them were quite powerful, uh, LSD, um, mind-altering drugs, and experiences that, that just destroyed his will to live, and <clears throat> his marriage broke down, and um, there, there wasn't much I could do at the time. We went, When we had uh, more opportunity, we had an open door for him, and we, we tried to encourage him to come over as much as he could. Um, we, he, he enjoyed our, our girls, you know, when Uncle George came, uh, the girls would run up to him and sit on his lap and, and ask him to tell them stories. And, and he seemed to enjoy that. He, he, he would smile and he would, he would, uh, he would be with the, the girls. And we tried to make it our time with him nice. Um, we didn't. We didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. I. I didn't know about counseling. I was falling apart in my own way, and and I needed help. And I didn't understand um, how badly I needed help. And um, you know, so it wasn't until some time quite later that I I got to understanding what could be done but by then it was it was too late and and uh, there's there have been a lot of regrets uh, on my part over the years uh, even though my counselor tries to to give me the idea of, you know, console me that, that it really wasn't my fault, that there wasn't really a whole lot that I could have done to help him. I, I, I looking back, I wish there was more that I could have done and, and I feel awful about it. And I still get very, very emotional about my brother's suicide because I think it could have been prevented. And I think it could have, he could have had a, a life where he could have had a measure of happiness. Um, my brother James uh, told a story about George and um, <clears throat> growing up, I wasn't, very close to either one of them. I had separate friends. I had a separate group. Uh, they they were very strongly bonded together, my two younger brothers, and they had their circle of friends. And and uh, there was a, a time when my brother, um, who was very athletically gifted. Um, very athletically gifted. He was uh, phenomenal. He was a big guy, strong. He grew up to be big and strong. He was 6'3". He could uh, toss a football as far as a professional football player. I mean, there was no... He was gifted that way. You could knock him off his feet. I'm no small person, and I, I could lift a... I could lift a 400-pound uh, Honda engine uh, deadlift uh, assembled when I was a young man, uh, but I could not knock that guy off his feet playing football. He was he was a very very agile, very talented, gifted, uh, physically gifted person. Um, but. The, 
there was a there there was a um, I'm trying to think now where I was going with this, but uh, yeah, there there was um, there were a lot of things that that I regret as as an older brother that I could have done. I wish that I was I could have done for him. Um, and there wasn't, and he was certain that God had abandoned him, that that he was going to the second death. You see, he believed everything that was taught. You see, we were infused with shame. We were infused with shame and guilt because that's what the Bible students are about. I I was listening to a, there. You know, there is a YouTube channel now on the Bible students and. Um, and there are quite a few, uh, somebody uh, uploaded quite a few um, Bible student um, videos, and a, quite a number of them are traditional type Bible student, doctrinal type talks. And uh, one of them was on the ransom. And there were, it got right to the point that with the ransom, that there are three elements to the ransom first that it, it, it as it applied to the Christian church which are those that are consecrated and and give up their lives um, in baptism to serve God and to um, and to um, run for the the prize of the high calling and uh he immediately said that you know those that baptize there are only three options for them one is to become successful and to gain the prize that they're running for uh, the second uh was um that you make the great company. Now the Bible students have a different take. They have the original take on the great company. The original teaching, uh, as Russell taught it, uh, Rutherford later changed it, but um, Russell taught that the great company was a spirit class. They were not uh, immortal, uh, that they were kind of like angels, that uh, those individuals who had been baptized had given up their right uh, for a human resurrection in the kingdom. Uh, so they, they've they given up that chance of, of, of being resurrected in human form. Uh, but because they didn't meet the criteria for um, being uh, one of the 144,000 uh, they 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 don't deserve that reward. So um, God made this provision uh, as represented by the scapegoat and the tabernacle shadows uh, that the that the um, this great company uh, was a spiritual class. Uh, they they were resurrected to the spirit plane, but they they weren't going to be kings and priests in the thousand year kingdom and then there were the rest of humanity who would be resurrected and uh, gain an opportunity to learn it says all that are in the graves will hear the voice of the son of god i think that's john gospel of john the sixth chapter and uh they would uh, hear the voice of the son of man and they, you know they would uh, come forth and uh, and and have an opportunity to uh, gain eternal uh, life on the human plane um, here on earth, and they'd live for eternity on earth, um, much the same way that uh, JWs believe that uh, the uh, what was originally called the Jonadab. They still refer to them as the great company or great crowd. Um, the, 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 
that's the, the, the idea that they would be perfect human beings uh, forever, except it's the majority of the world, the way the Bible students teach it versus Rutherford's application, which narrowed it down significantly. And that's why he placed the urgency on, on the need to um, go out and witness and get as many people saved as possible so that they can live an eternity on earth. And that uh, the, the 144,000, the anointed class, uh, was a relatively uh, select and uh, elite group of individuals that um, would uh, much, much uh, smaller group uh, that um, would would be part of that high calling or they, you know, drop that terminology, but they'd be part of the 144,000. So there are slight differences in the in the teachings, uh, but ultimately the the idea is all things will be rectified in the kingdom in the thousand years, and and those that who would want to see their loved ones again um, would have that opportunity in the resurrection, and that's a very cruel, very cruel teaching because it's not the truth and it's 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 putting your hopes into something and giving up your life uh and doing what the religion expects you to do living according to their values according to their ways uh making sacrifices in your life and making this life uh, of, of little consequence other than being a trial for, for um, the future, um, you know, whether or not you're, you're uh, worthy of the rewards that God's going to give you in the future. Uh, that's the only thing that this life, you're being tested in this life, for the next life, but the next life is what counts, and uh, and the and the reason this life doesn't work is not worthy of much consideration is because we're shamed, we're evil, we're sinful, we're not worth anything. Uh, that all our worth is tied up in the in the um, the hope that uh, that. Uh, the 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 Bible uh, has has offered to us that God has offered to us as taught in the Bible. That's that's what Bible students hold, and so um, it's it's a um, it, it's it's basically a very cruel thing because um, in reality. The Bible doesn't. The Bible doesn't offer anything. There may be some principles and teachings in the Bible that that have some merit, but um, the, as a whole, um, it's just um, you know a a book of. of superstitious teachings by primitive men that had just come out of an era of believing in multiple gods, Zeus and Jupiter, Apollo, and, and you know, all of the Greek Roman gods. And the the, the the Christianity is even a sort of a uh, an amalgamation of those ancient beliefs to to Christian teachings and Judeo-Christian um, 
heritage uh, that was uh, started in the first centuries uh, AD. And um, many things like Easter and Christmas are compromise um, celebrations with with pagan practices and uh, and that was that's always true um, the, the the ancient Jews believed that God had a wife before the Babylonian captivity there's strong archaeological evidence that that the those Canaanites that had become the Jewish nation because that's more of how they came to be than being a select people. There's no evidence that there was ever an Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. Uh, there were no 12 sons and tribes of Israel. This is all, there's no validation for that. Uh, certainly, Genesis can't be backed up. There is no evidence for any of uh, Genesis. Uh, we know that the science of Genesis is just complete wrong, completely wrong. Um, there's there's very little argument that anybody can give the, to support the Bible, and uh, and uh, the Bible students. Uh, never really address those. Now, the Bible students promote themselves uh, as Bible scholars, that they have the truth from the Bible and that, they, that they've been able to glean the truth. This, this came from Russell. But Russell studied in the 19th century. He was not a scholar. He had nothing more than a seventh grade education. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't understand science as we understand it today. Uh, he he uh, clung to and was attracted by uh, crank uh, concepts and ideas such as the pyramid uh, being associated with God that came from Charles Piazzi Smythe and and John Taylor, um, who in the 1850s and 60s uh, began to promote the idea that the pyramid had uh, some some uh, significance from you know spiritual significance uh, from God. And um, you know this. This uh, there, there there isn't any sound uh, sound uh, scholarly uh, study that uh, has gone into uh, Bible student doctrine. Uh, just the, the the voluminous writings of a man who uh, just took the Bible at face value. I mean. We know today that scholars uh, question the, the the veracity and the validity of the of the Bible. I mean, even the the, the epistles, um, uh, at least half of them, if not more, uh, are are known forgeries that they. That they were not written by the people attributed to them. Second Peter, for example, was not written by Peter. Um, a good number of the epistles of, of Paul were not written by Paul. Uh, the book of Hebrews was not written by Paul. Um, these are critical books to Bible student teachings. Um, if you could trim down the number of books uh, that can be validated and supported, you, you would have to eliminate the Gospels. You would have to eliminate um, many of the epistles and the, uh, the 
right there, you, you have the New Testament cut way down. So what would you be able to glean out of that? Uh, and, and there's no evidence that any of those epistles were really um, given uh, to the, you know, Paul as inspired writings um, or, or any of the other apostles that, that uh, claim to be the authors. Um, you know, there, there's, there's what, can, what can you piece together? I mean, Second Peter uh, has a key. Bible teachings in it. The book of Hebrews has key Bible student teachings in it. The um, whole idea of the tabernacle as being a type uh, comes out of Hebrews. Uh, the um, idea that the, the uh, 144,000, the church class, the uh, the the those that are running for the high calling uh, would be gaining the divine nature that that comes out of Second Peter. The day of the Lord is as a thousand years comes out of Peter, and uh, the the uh, where is the coming of His presence uh, comes out of Second Peter. These all of these uh, things. Are, are critical books to the to the Bible students. The Bible students can't answer these because they're not true scholars. None of them are. None of them are. They're all lay people that read the Bible, read Russell's works, and and take it at face value. And then none of them are are scholars. None of them are uh, textual. Uh, specialists, at, uh, you know, like Bart Ehrman, who uh, does uh, textual analysis, and he can he can spot where uh, there was uh, a forgery or where there where there were errors in transcription that that were uh, made in in the scriptures. Um, when you stop and you think about how the canon was put together. Uh, over the centuries, uh, from the first century to the fourth century, when the the Bible was compiled, uh, was by the consensus of the majority opinion of the predominant um, the 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 faction of. Christians that gain dominance. Uh, there are many different uh, factions of Christians, especially in the early days. You had the Gnostics and you had the, the Judeo-Christians that held to the precepts of the law. And you had uh, the, the Western Roman Church under the papacy, under the Bishop of Rome. And then you had the Eastern uh, Church and, and you had Arianism uh, also in the Eastern uh, segment of the empire. And, and there were many, many varieties and brands and flavors of Christianity. And even today, I mean, the, the Roman Catholics accept books that the Protestants don't accept. The Gnostics accept books that, uh, you know, the Coptic Christians are more or less the descendants of the Gnostics. And they, um, they, they have a whole slew of books that, that are uh, not accepted by uh, mainstream Protestants. And uh, the Judeo Christians just went out of existence. They they were more of a really of a sect of Judaism than they were Christians. Um, uh, the the Protestants uh, they split from the Catholics in the in the Renaissance period under Martin Luther and mainly because of 
the, I don't know, ritualistic uh, side of Catholicism that they, uh, that they developed um, these ideas that, that were really unscriptural and, and uh, Luther was trying to make an attempt to return to the early church first century Christianity and that's been uh, the attempt of uh, many uh, Bible reformers and Bible teachers uh, throughout uh, the subsequent years especially in the 19th century I mean that was Russell's claim was to try and return to first century practices and and return to the truth uh, as as it was taught by um, the apostles in the in the first century um, A.D., and so uh, they they um, but they have no they have no uh, real no real scholars to support to give them any support whatsoever about whether or not the, 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 what they teach is true. They, there, there was something that I saw was, was, the, was the Bible teachings corrupted? Well, they gave the answer in the context of, the, of a parable of the, of the uh, of the uh, wheat and tares, and that's using the Bible to conjecture or support a thought or teaching on the Bible, and that doesn't, you know, to me, it, you know, the the question is: Is the Bible itself supported? Uh, can the can uh, biblical scholars uh, tell us for certain that the Bible indeed is the inspired word of God, and they can't do that. And and there's so many contradictions uh, that um, that that reside in the in the bible so many contradictions in 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 what the bible says about nature uh that uh that it it it, it certainly stands in conflict with our current knowledge of science today that we cannot we cannot accept those teachings you know and and it's not a test for our faith to throw doubt i mean why would god deliberately deliberately get the science wrong so that he would test our faith in the truth it's it wouldn't be right it wouldn't be honest it wouldn't be fair is that is that the kind of God that we'd want to serve? Is 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 it true that that we want a God who created us and then create allowed us to become wicked and then condemn us as shame, uh, shame, uh, you know, with shame and with with. Uh, with the idea that we're worthless, uh, sinful creatures that were in need of salvation, and that we should be that we should be uh, obligated uh, to uh, God's salvation that He gave us, it's His fault. If there's anything at all for permitting us to 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 be to, to to come into this condition it's his fault so why should we be obligated to to serve him to 
humble ourselves to this God that that created us to to be obligated to him I mean that is that 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 is wrong and that's selfish if I was going to create somebody I don't hold my own children obligate you know if I obligated my children to me I'm wrong I'm wrong they I brought them into this world because I wanted a new life to be able to enjoy the opportunity of the world and the beauties of this world because there is so much beauty in this world and I don't hold them obligated to me in fact it's quite the opposite I I feel the obligation to them as a parent for having brought them into this world and, and, and to take care of them. I don't shame them into obedience. I don't tell them that, that because they have a mind of their own and, and they, they don't do what I want them to do, uh, that they're shameful, that they're wicked, that they they need correcting and that they need salvation no i don't do that to my children and it would be wrong to do so and if that's the way god operates it's wrong for him well i got carried off on another little rant again so but I think they're important considerations because there there's there there is a lot from a moral sense from an innate an innately moral sense because we each have an innate sense of morality of what's right and what's wrong and you know, to to shame me, to guilt me. And I think, you know, in a way, uh, young people tend to be maybe a little more vulnerable to this for, for one thing, um, because our brains aren't fully developed until we're in our later 20s, for one thing, especially the, the, the judgmental part of our brain. Uh, the, the stop, go, uh, right, wrong uh, part of it um, isn't fully developed until we're 25 or later. And um, yet, you know, we, we give independence and begin to live life and that, and we can make mistakes. And, and if we've been told all our life that we were born into sin, that we were sinful, that we were that we were uh, shameful, you know. Um, I, I can remember um, my parents uh, telling me I should be ashamed of myself. Um, that that is that is wrong, because that tells me about something inherent about me, something that that is uh, a part of my my being, my character, me, um, and, and, and that reinforced idea that I'm sinful. And when, despite the fact that I knew that the, the religion was an imposition on me, I, Later, after my initial rebellious teenage years, I didn't believe any differently. I believed that what I had been taught was the truth. They had the hook. They just let me run on my rebellion, and then they reeled me back in with the shame and the guilt 
and I think that that young people, even if they have that period of of rebellion or even a sense that they're being imposed upon by the religion, they can get to feeling that they were wrong. I remember when I was reaching a critical point um, in my early 20s, and uh, I was getting into some trouble, um, and I thought they were right about me. They, they, they were right about me, and that I needed to come back. I was the, I was the prodigal son. I was the uh, one that was wrong. That I needed to repent. That I needed to come back, and and do my penance and to try and rectify my sins and to to um, come back and do what I could to redeem myself and to dedicate my life to God because I was a bad person and to rectify the wrongs and the willfulness and the willful sins that I committed that uh, I needed to reverse in my life. And so they, they reeled me back in and I made the plunge. I took the I got baptized when I was 23, and I spent many, many, many years earnestly trying to make up for all of the all of the um, you know rebellious things that that I did that were my fault that things that I did. It almost killed me doing it. And it wasn't until a long time later that I realized that it was them, not me. But that's for another story. I just um, want to give out this warning because I do think that especially inexperienced, you know, young and inexperienced people who've been told all their lives that they've been, you know, that they, they were born in this sinful condition uh, are much more vulnerable to making the, you know, letting, letting the religion get back into your head and tell you that, yes, you are evil and you are wrong and you are in need of repentance. And so that uh, they, they need, um, you need salvation, you need to come back. And I think that there is a danger of, despite maybe um, a brief period of rebellion, uh, that, that you may, end up coming back again that's that's what happened to me and i didn't i didn't really get to see things um correctly until i was well into my 40s late 40s early 50s when i realized that my faith was not helping me with the problems that I was facing. In fact, it was exacerbating the problems if it wasn't the cause of the problems themselves. So it, it took a good long time, many, many years. And um, it could have been avoided if I had had counseling earlier. But 
I don't regret in many ways because I think all things are learning experience and I had my opportunity at learning. Um, and that's what all those years were about. And it makes my time today all that much more precious and all I, I cherish it so much more because now I I've been able to find my own freedom and and it was my decision it was my I'm free and I'm free to think freely without anybody telling me what to do or how bad I am or how sinful I am and how much need I am of repentance and of uh, Jesus' sacrifice to redeem me from my sins. You know, I, I, I just think that it, it's such an insidiously evil way to keep people under their control. So anyway, this is Truth Seeker here, and um, I wish you all the best.